This week, we interview Tim Ferriss, the man behind Defiant Whiskey, in studio for a live interview. And more importantly, to drink whiskey and smoke cigars. Debonair Ideal this week will discuss the best cigars to give to friends, maybe enemies. And in the Stogies of the Week, Will and I talk about a blend change that seems to have not started off so well. Then Will riots with a pigtail. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady, it's the Stogie Geek Show! If you created the Aging Room Small Batch Cigar Line, the highest rated boutique cigar brand of our times, what would you do next? Well, if you're Raphael Nodell from Boutique Blend Cigars, you would combine your three most important passions of your life. Cuba, music, and cigars, and create a new classic, La Bohème Cigars. La Bohème is Raphael's take on the golden age of Cuban cigars. La Bohème is a sophisticated blend of extra aged and hard to find tobaccos from the Dominican Republic. A medium bodied cigar, rich in flavors reminiscent of the island he left 35 years ago in a small boat with his family. Why wait for the embargo to be lifted? Smoke La Bohème today. Blending is in our DNA. Duran Premium Cigars, one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, providing smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Palayo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offer the same quality, construction, and detail which he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the Ultra Premium Roberto P. Duran Premium Cigar Series, Azan Cigars, Naya, and Baracoa. Duran Cigars uses a seed to humidor approach as all tobacco is grown on their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure the progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Cigars invites you to make their premium your standard. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. The founder of Defiant Whiskey, Tim Ferriss, built the distillery, the company, and the brand organically in the mountains of western North Carolina, in between deep sea commercial diving jobs. Tim will now explain a little bit about the spirit behind Defiant Whiskey. These guys are masters. They're, they're artisans. I wanted to learn how to do that. I wanted to learn how to make a spirit that people tasted and was like, oh my God, that's incredible. You taste that quality. You taste that drive. You taste that passion. The minute they take a sip, the conversation's over and they're just going, that's incredible. Welcome, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode 156 for September 17th, 2015. And look, speaking of Defiant Whiskey, Tim Ferriss is here in studio. Welcome, Tim. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. I recognized your voice right away. As soon as you started talking, I'm like, it sounds so familiar. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's your voice in the commercial. That's right. So, That's right. Yeah, it's awesome. I want to welcome Will Cooper on the lines via Skype from North Carolina. Greetings, everybody. Which Hello, is Will. where they make hey, Defiant Whiskey. It is. Which is awesome. It's awesome. I actually visited that. I actually visited that place. That's great. We'll That's, talk about that. That's an incredible place. It's on, my, it's on my bucket list. It's, good. Yep. it's not too far. Jump on a plane. That's right. My dad lives in Mooresville, North Carolina. Where's actually. Mooresville? Uh, right outside Charlotte. Okay. Yeah. So not too far it's from actually, where it's it actually pretty. It's actually not too far. It's probably about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Outside yeah. of Charlotte. That's nothing yeah. in, in North Carolina. In Rhode Island, you drive an hour and you're in another state. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> Unless you're doing circles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, well, it's good to be here. We're smoking an Unbanded. Why don't you tell us uh, who this came from and uh, a little bit about this Unbanded. It's from Seth's Geese of Seth's Humidor who sent us a series of Unbanded. I think we'll be doing over, a, over the next several weeks. Uh, this is a Perfecto, uh, which nice oily, uh, dark oily wrapper on this thing. Um, I had I had an initial guess what this may be, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure just from looking at it. You were confident just by looking at it, dude. Yeah, but then I looked at the dimensions of the cigar, and it's off. It's off. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Gotcha. And I'll, I'll, as we get into it, I'll, I'll kind of tell what my guess is, but I, I don't think it's what I thought it was. Especially now smoking it, it, it isn't what I thought it was. You think it's a, a 6 by 52 Perfecto? Yeah, and that's what made me think of one brand in particular. Yep. Um, so I think we got the size nailed down. Mine has a really serious vein that runs through the whole side of the cigar. Uh, it's smoking great, though. And, I, so, and so does mine, which is what made me think it is one brand. Yeah, interesting. It, yeah. Um, it's good so far. I'm, I'm almost, I'm into the, the first third. It's very smooth. It's got some it's, unique flavors to it. It's smooth. It's, it's earthy. A little pepper on it. It's, it's, it's very good. It's almost it's like well a, aged. This um, is well aged. Almost like a fruit kind of note to it, like a dark yeah. cherry kind of fruit note dark to it. Dark cherry in the background, yeah. yeah in the back, but not yeah. overly sweet. Not, no, not, not overly, overly sweet at all. But I'm enjoying it so far. Me now, too. Tim, I gave him uh, an H up in Magnum 46, I think from 2008 or something like that. Someone's kicking oh, around the humidor. So wow, it's yeah. lovely. Those are those are really good cigars. Um, the age on the Cuban cigars is definitely the way to go. So. It, that may be one of my all-time... I mean, really, I put that in my top three as far as Cubans go of all time. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm excited for this show. Tim is, is here in studio. Um, the founder and CEO, your acting CEO of Defiant Whiskey, is that... Uh, upper level, lower middle management. <laughs> 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 to coin a... Uh, nice. To coin a, a like favorite. It. But no, whiskey is not... You, it's not, you didn't start uh, your career, your profession... Nope. Making whiskey. Nope. So uh, how, how did you start your career? My career is deep sea commercial diving. Wow. And, what, is, uh, what is deep sea commercial diving? What does that mean? Hard hat diving. You know, big heavy construction diving mm -hmm. where, you know, being underwater is just kind of a prerequisite to what's going on. And it's, it's less about the diving and more about being able to work underwater. So we do, but you, you, you dive in the water with all the scuba gear and go do all that? Heavy gear. Heavy so gear. hard hat, harnesses, yeah. and we're down there working on oil rigs. Yeah. Oh, so you're building. You're not salvaging. I've split my time between deep oil and gas diving yeah. and then international emergency response salvage diving. Okay. And uh, emergency response salvage really gets my blood pumping. I it's bet. exciting stuff. So is that like something valuable has gone down in the water or something dangerous or either or? Uh, you know, well, a big container ship or mm -hmm. a bulk freighter, these things have a pretty good value to them. And then the uh, cargoes that they carry right. have a pretty good value to them. Yeah, unless they're electronics and once they go in the water, right. not so much yet. <laughs> and nowadays, yeah. you know, the big focus on salvage has shifted to where the environment used to, you know, 50, 50 100 years ago was mm -hmm. not really a concern at all. Now the environment is the second concern after loss of life or, you know, safety of life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, making sure that there's no oil spills or chemical leaks or anything like that has become mm -hmm. a, big, a big part of the job. Wow, that's cool. Yep. Um, so that drove you to like whiskey and cigars. <laughs> I always <laughs> liked whiskey. Uh, I had, uh, in my younger days, I, let, me, let me take that statement back. I wanted to like whiskey. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the old movies, the <clears throat> tough guy slugs down a mm -hmm. big old swig of whiskey, doesn't even flinch. And uh, I was not up to that, that level yet. And uh, you take a swig and you're like, oh, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't do it either at first. I was, and most people are not, and most people when they come to drinking age are not whiskey drinkers. No. Right? I mean, they might have a whiskey sour or something like a yeah. mixed drink, but exactly. they're not whiskey drinkers or scotch or bourbon or anything like that. Scotch. Right? The first time I took a sip of 12 year Macallan, mm -hmm. I was floored. I had it room temperature, neat. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. And I was excited by the fact that I loved it. And it impacted me. And I grew up watching episodes of MASH. And, you know, you see the, you see the guys in their smoking jackets in the mm -hmm. Army tent and yeah. on the front lines in a war zone. Still living a gentleman's life, you know. And they've got right. their little still in the background. And I said, I want to learn how to make whiskey. Mm. And I did. So, so I, I wanted to add, I mean, it's an interesting segue. I wanted to ask you, and I think a lot of us have kind of um, knowledge that we get kind of like on the fray, right? Like we hear one thing from one person. We maybe read an article about how whiskey is made. Um, you know, we talk to a representative and yeah. they tell you a little bit about, you know, like their process. But, um, and I, I was really big into beer, so I'm pretty good at understanding how beer is made. But how, yeah. how is whiskey made? 
The first step to making a whiskey is to making a good beer. And the better you are at making a quality beer or distiller's beer, Mm -hmm. the better the distillate. So a lot of people before, without having any knowledge of distilling or brewing, Mm -hmm. they assume that uh, whiskey making is all about distill. Mm. Whiskey making is all about your fermentation. And if you, fermentation is where alcohol is created. I see. If you don't get that part right, Mm -hmm. you're just going to concentrate a flaw in the still. I see. So you want to make sure that you're doing everything right fermentation-wise, Mm mash-wise, yeast selection, grain selection, and then the marriage of those. So you make beer. I mean, that's you just described the recipe for making beer, right? You you make a a barley wine. You make a barley wine. I uh, I say, okay. Yep. How does barley wine differ from from beer in the process? Percentage of alcohol. Okay. So So does that mean you're adding more yeast and more sugar? No, we add about twice the amount of barley per gallon of, of mash water than a standard distiller would. Which produces more sugar, which yep. in, after the yeast gets in there, produces more alcohol. That's right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. But you, uh, how do you get the CO2 level? The barley wine has a much less CO2 level, right? So how do you get the CO2 level down? As far as during fermentation? Yeah. We oxygenate it. Okay. And then we allow the fermenters to vent yep. pretty, pretty much openly. I got gotcha. you. I so got gotcha. you. With the beer making, you're going to go a few extra steps for mm-hmm. a beer that's going to be consumed by a human. Mm-hmm. Our beer is consumed by the still. Mm-hmm. So what we want to care about is that we have clean alcohol produced with uh, a very predominant barley signature nose and flavor to that beer. Mm-hmm. And once it goes into the still, we want that barley carry through. And the still is essentially boiling it again. Turning it into a gas, which then turns it back into a liquid. Yep, you're just right? isolating. I remember my science class yeah, exactly. correctly. <laughs> you're you're boiling it. So you know, if you have pure alcohol, your boiling points at one seventy two. Mm-hmm. Pure water boils at two twelve. So your still run will always be somewhere between one seventy two and mm-hmm. two twelve. Mm-hmm. If your still is still boiling and the mash temperatures at two twelve or above, you're making distilled water. Oh, I see. Because so you're just burning the alcohol off. The like when you're cooking. Right. Yeah, like when you're exactly. cooking, you put wine and you would get it really hot to burn the alcohol off. That's right. I got gotcha. you. That's right. Oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Yep. Um, so you are, the grains you're using are barley from, like, where do you source that? American from? Midwest. Okay. We use a two row pale ale brewer's barley. Mm-hmm. It's a much higher quality barley. And if you looked at you know, a handful of distiller's barley malt mm-hmm. and a handful of brewer's malt, the distiller's malt looks like sun-dried wild rice. It's just, it looks terrible. Mm-hmm. But it's cheap. Right. And so a lot of distillers kind of, I guess the older philosophy is, well, you know, the, the still is going to consume the beer so we can get away with using a cheaper, cheaper grain. Yeah. Our philosophy is we're a small brand. Nobody knows who we are. We've got to make an impact on somebody with the first sip. Mm-hmm. So we can't afford to, nor would we want to, skimp on ingredients, methodology, mm-hmm. equipment, Anything along the way. Mm-hmm. And if we put a, our attention to detail at the utmost in every, every avenue that we could, mm-hmm. those are going to stack up to make a quality distillate. Now, um, it, excuse my ignorance. So do you add hop, hops to the mix? No. Like you would beer? No hops. It's, no just hops. Bar, it's just barley. Yep. Our ingredients are water, mm-hmm. barley, yeast, and American white oak. That's it. Mm-hmm. Nothing else. Right, because after you distill, then the second part of the, or the third part of the process or maturing, or ma- maturing is you right. put it in barrels, and so now. But where do you get the? I, you know, I he, again, I hear, uh, you know, it on the fray, right? I talk to people as well. You know, this scotch or this whiskey or this bourbon's age in this kind of barrel and that kind of barrel, and then the whole blending thing. So, like, how do you what do you do your barrels? We don't use barrels at all. Okay, no <laughs> barrels. I was at a distilling seminar a number of years ago, Mm -hmm. and there was a guy that was introducing these oak infusion spirals, and he was getting into the science behind them, and it just made sense to me, and they'd been used for oaking fine wines, Mm -hmm. and to the best of my knowledge at the time, nobody had ever used them to make a distilled spirit with, Mm -hmm. to age a spirit, and I, uh, my goal in the company was to not put a white dog or a a non-aged product on the shelf. I really wanted to take the time to put something that we all believed in and that was that was good, but we didn't have the capital or the revenue to be able to barrel age for, you know, 10, 12 years before we hit the market. We had to get on the market for cash flow. So I ordered a bunch of these spirals and I started ma- messing around with different amounts and different types of toast levels and I was shocked. So you to- so you take wood spirals 
yep. basically dried as they come out of the tree, essentially. Yep. And then you took a flame to them? Nope. So they're, how do you... They're hot air convection toasted. Okay. So most barrels are charred. You like have, a toaster oven? <laughs> yeah, basically. Like, like a giant like toaster a, oven, Like a right? giant convection oven. Yeah, okay. So a flame will actually char the wood. Mm-hmm. And if you have a distillate that has some flaws in it, the char will actually absorb some of the toxins in that mm-hmm. in that distillate, which are natural to distillates, and it won't re-release it. Well, we, our philosophy is don't allow a flaw in your distillate in the first place. Mm-hmm. So we go the extra mile to make sure that during f- mashing fermentation, we don't produce a flaw, mm-hmm. and that during distillation, we don't concentrate or collect a flaw. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, our our saying is rather than putting our whiskey in a barrel, we put our barrel in the whiskey. Mm. So you take that spiral... After it's been toasted. Yep. Is that the right term? It's the term you use, right? Toasted? That's right. Um, and so do you put them in the... Uh, after it's distilled, what are they stored in that you put the wood inside of? We use 350-gallon stackable stainless steel tanks. And then you put the wood right inside of those? Yep. So we look at oak like uh, almost like a, like a tea. Mm-hmm. And when we oak the whiskey, so the whiskey will be in the tote and it's crystal clear. I mean, you can see the bottom of the After tank. After distilling, right, it's clear. It's That's crystal clear. Moonshine is clear, right? Because yeah. they're not, they're just taking it away from the still. New make distillate is almost clearer than water. And it should be clear, yeah. right? You, that's Nothing floating in it, no coloration. You mm-hmm. don't want any greens or any blues. That means you've got something going something on going in the still that's yeah. not right. Okay. So we'll introduce the oak into the whiskey. And within the first 24 hours, we get a natural amber color that's darker than most 12 year single malt scotches, 100% naturally. Hmm. Amazing. If That's you think really about cool. a barrel, nobody, nobody ever sat down and designed a barrel with the purpose to age whiskey. They were just the shipping and storage container of the day. Right. Or they borrowed it from wine places, right? A lot of them take, do a lot of them take it from wine or cognac, right? And put, or the definition of bourbon is are they have to use American new oak, which mm-hmm. means it hasn't aged anything previously. I got gotcha. you. Whereas a lot of your scotches will take a, a variety of different casks. Sherry from rum cast, cast to sherry yeah, cast, okay, port yeah, wine casks. Right. And you get a little bit of that signature. I wanted to make a whiskey that, as an American single malt, the last thing in the world we wanted to do was to try to be a scotch. Mm -hmm. We wanted to put the best ingredients that we could find together with the best methodology and just discover what our flavor profile was. That being said, I do get like a little bit of like a smoky peatiness from from the defiant whiskey. You're not alone in saying that. Okay. And there's a lot of people that say they me. taste a little hint of peat. Yeah. What surprises me is there's no peat smoke on the grain during malting at mm-hmm. all. It's an American uh, two-row pale ale brewer's malt. Is that how they get that smoky peatiness is in the malt before it's, they put yeah. it in the in, before they make the mash? That's right. Okay. So the malting process is you germinate the grain, you trick it into thinking that it's going to grow. Yep. It releases an enzyme inside of itself. And you soak you soak them to yes. do that, right? You steep it. In just water? Yep, hot water, the right temperature, warm water. Okay. The grain germinates. It releases an enzyme that starts to convert the stable starch Mm -hmm. of the grain kernel into sugars that it's going to need to have the energy to sink its little tap root and sprout. Oh, okay. And so at that point, they arrest it. They And in Scotland, they would use cut peat from peat bogs as a fuel source mm-hmm. to fire their kilns, and the smoke from the furnaces would get into the malting floors mm-hmm. and smoke the grain. Oh, I and see. that's become a very signature flavor of scotch. Right. But you didn't do it that way, so where does that peatiness... I think there's no peat. And, and one of right. my thoughts are, I wonder if there's a, a measure of what we've mistaken or put onto a peat uh, profile that's just natural to the barley, mm-hmm. uh, but I right, like it. Right. I like it a lot. Yeah, it's very good. Well, sorry, I did. I w- we were just geeking out over making no, whiskey. It, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Tim, because there's a uh, a company we're going to be having them on in a few weeks um, that's actually doing peat fired tobacco right now. Really? So what they're doing is they're um, actually there's a lot of like tobacco. A lot of times we fire cured with wood. Yeah. Um, it's typically more used in pipes, but sometimes it's in cigars. But this company is actually taking peat, and they're uh, they're fire curing it uh, with the peat. So it's kind of the first time that's ever been done. Wow. Yeah. I smoke the cigar. It's very unique. I bet. Well. And it's, it's very peaty, that's for sure. Really? Yeah. You just have to send me a couple. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, you'll definitely uh, – we'll do that. Um, so, Tim, in terms of um, – what made you pick North Carolina um, as far as the place to put your distillery? Just lucky, I guess. 
I moved there uh, about 22 years ago with my parents. And it was just, it was home. I, I grew up in Connecticut, shoreline of Connecticut. I grew up on the ocean and uh, moved to the mountains of North Carolina. I fell in love. It was out in the middle of nowhere. You know, you could drive like a banshee through the woods and shoot guns and have fun. And it was, it was great. We need to hang out more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just kind of took it for granted. And it was the place that I always came back to in my travels to, you know, do laundry and switch duffel bags and get ready yeah. for the next adventure. And Where uh, in the mountains did you... We're about 45 minutes southeast of Asheville, North Carolina. Okay. Yep. Almost be just about between Asheville and Charlotte. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I did some I mountain bike through there once. It's gorgeous country. Solly? From the Solly is a like a mountain biking destination. I don't know. Yeah, it's in the it's in the the mountains out there. I have time. And Asheville is of course gorgeous. Asheville's gorgeous. Yeah, gorgeous yeah. city. I yeah. mean, it when you go from Charlotte to that area in like November and December, it's you, it's winter. You really see winter there. It's mm. a big climate change almost because there's more snow. Higher mountains. I mean, they're the highest mountains I've seen in the east. They are. Uh, when you get into that area. Mount Mitchell's the highest peak east of the Mississippi. Yep. Yep. I was looking at the temperatures today, and, uh, you know, we've got lows in the 50s. And I was checking because I'm going to Boston in the morning. And Boston was 84. North Carolina was 80 with lows in the 50s. Boston was 84 with lows in the 60s. And I'm thinking, no kidding. Who mm -hmm. would have thought? Um, so w w you live in North Carolina now? I do. I'm on the farm. Yep, where Excellent. we make the whiskey. No, that's cool. And so where in North Carolina do you make the, the whiskey? It's called Golden Valley, North Carolina. It's out nice. in the middle of what nowhere. A perfect place. It sounds like a perfect city name. It's not for a city. Or the town is town. It's not. It's, it's an area called Golden Valley. It's got this notorious, uh, nefarious kind of uh, reputation for being the moonshine epicenter of Western North Carolina. Perfect place to be. The, the name, the history, everything is perfect place to, to it's make It's great. Yeah. And the big, the big reason for it is the water there the water. Is, yeah. is flawless. The mm -hmm. pH of the water is perfect. The mineral mm -hmm. content is perfect. It has everything you want and nothing you don't want. We pump our water out of the ground. It comes straight into the distillery into our mash tons, into our fermenters, into our cutting tanks, wow. and we don't filter it, we mm -hmm. don't alter it, we don't do anything to it. We're, it's awesome. That's really cool. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so, well, I'm sorry, I'm, high, I'm not doing a bad job of including you in this interview. No, no, <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> okay. So, you know, and Tim, I had, I had a chance to visit the distillery with uh, Mark Boley, uh, and it was, um, it, it's fantastic. Now, one thing that you guys did, I thought that was real unique, is right kind of right down the road you guys have acquired i, I want to say it's like a corporate retreat center now but it was an old girl scout camp it was a what, retired girl scout camp yeah what do you what do you why don't you tell folks what you what you're doing with that because i think it's real unique so you know we're on a, a good piece of property where the distillery is now it's about 100 acres but it's you know it shares a common driveway I didn't want to start to build the place out and, and have a, a bunch of traffic come through for the neighbors. So I'd, I'd been on the property for 22 years, and I knew there was this old scout camp, and I'd never been there. I went and I took a look at it, and I was absolutely floored with how gorgeous this property was. So serendipitously, one day I find out that it's going on the market. Mm -hmm. And we opened a dialogue with the, uh, the scout council, and we wound, up, uh, we wound up signing papers on it last June. And it's a 550-acre wow. property, 17-acre lake, main lodge. It's got all the buildings that we need. So we've 550 already, acres is like a third of the state of Rhode Island. It's, yeah. It might be half the state. <laughs> it might it's, be half. It's yeah. big. It's, it's unbelievable. Real big. <laughs> did, you get the, did you get a chance, Will, to go and see the, the, the camp? Yes, I did. Isn't uh, it, we, yep. It's remarkable. It, let's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Let's put it like this, Paul. We drank whiskey and smoked cigars all day. That's um, and we know, just had a, a ball. I mean, it was just my kind of my kind of day. Right by there's a there's a there's a there's a lake kind of or a pond right there. Um, and we just kind of sat there. And Seventeen acre body of water in Rhode Island. We call that a lake. It's a lake. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the cutoff is. I think yeah. I've, I've heard that three three acres and under is a pond. Three acres it's and over boat. is a okay. lake. It, it's more. It's big. Let's put it like this. It's not a little. It's not a little pond by any means. But I mean, there's a. I mean, you could swim in it and. Uh, it, uh, we, we went, I know you guys have the little uh, all-terrain vehicles we were going around yeah. on, on the campsite with. And it was just, it was just, I mean, we went up with a bunch of guys from a local cigar shop, and no one wanted to go home. It's a good place. It's a place where you can, you know, I think life is properly should be a, a, a strung-together series of experiences. 
and the camp is just a wonderful place to create those kind of experiences. It's, uh, we're looking at it to be the new campus, the new home of Defiant Whiskey, mm-hmm. where people can come and just have a wonderful place to kick their feet up, relax, be off the grid, enjoy for a little while. Also, there's no Wi-Fi there? There's no Wi-Fi. Yeah, there's so no, that's there's that's no the first service. question my kids ask, are we going anywhere? Is there Wi-Fi where we're going? I'm like, really? Do you lie to them? <laughs> Sometimes. There, there's, oh, no, there's, there's, no cell, there's no cell phone there either. No, there's not. I mean, and no one was missing it, Paul. I mean, yeah, we were just, no one, no you one missed unplug. it. You got to unplug. You got to unplug sometimes. No one, yeah. GoldenValleyEvents.com is the website for the camp. Sounds awesome. It's a good place. Yeah. And, I, and it's 100% smoke friendly, right? Yes, it is. Wow, look at that. I think we need to do a Stoey Geeks outing. A retreat. Yeah, a retreat. Yep. A Stoey Geeks retreat. I like that. Yeah. I like that. I mean, Tim, you have actually this cabins there so people could stay for the weekend. There's 60 buildings on the property. Mm. 18 tree houses, main lodge with a commercial kitchen. It's and all that was there when you bought it? Turnkey. Wow. Yeah. Come in, close the main gate, and just let loose and have fun. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so, Tim, how did you get into cigars? It's kind of the same thing, you know? You, you watch old war movies as a kid growing up, Ooh. and you, you see the tough guys, mm-hmm. you know, taking Shoot a bite on the cigar, cigar with the machine gun. Yeah. And, uh, I, I stole my first cigar from a boss I was working for when I was in my early teens working for this plumber. And I want to say it was a moneymaker. Connecticut Leaf. Money, mm-hmm. I don't know if you heard about him. Oh, no. The, uh, it was, like a U, was it a U.S. kind of based cigar? Or? Connecticut Leaf cover. I think they're, all, they're made in Connecticut. They're called mm-hmm. moneymakers. Mm-hmm. They smell terrible. They're, to- they're, <laughs> they're rotten. They're horrible, <laughs> horrible cigars. And I thought... Okay, I'm just going to have to get used to this to be a tough right, guy. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, lo and behold, one day somebody put a good cigar in my hand. Mm-hmm. And again, same kind of thing as the whiskey. I fell in love with them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm not one to suffer through a, a rotten cigar, but I certainly enjoy a good one. Mm. That was, that's a machine made cigar, the money maker. They're so, terrible. And when, once you go to a hand roll, Tim, it, it's, it's, it's night and day. That's true. I was lit yep. on fire by a by a moneymaker cigar one yep. cold winter day. Like they're, literally they're lit on these, fire. Yeah, I almost drove off the road. They're, they're <laughs> gritty, Paul. These are real like gritty. I, I know. I know these cigars. They're real gritty. Like is what I'll say. You know what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's funny because there's some hand rolled people that that will try to go for that gritty taste, but it's a lot better when it's hand rolled. I mean, because it's just they're terrible, is what I'll say to him. Did you guys make me not want to try a moneymaker? You don't cigar. No. A lot let of times me, I hear about a cigar, I'm like, oh, I haven't smoked that one yet. I gotta try it. This one, it's not on my to try list. You don't want it. Yeah. If you see a box of them, just be like, I've heard of those. No, yeah. <laughs> just pass and walk away. Uh, so, Tim, what are some of your your favorite cigars to smoke aside from Money Maker? <laughs> my my go to cigar for a long time was uh, Number Eight Maduro Partagas, mm-hmm. and I've heard that they've discontinued them. Yeah, I don't think. Does Partagas make him? Will's looking at him now. I can see him. He's, yeah, on, his, he's on his computer. He's got both hands on the I keyboard. His cigar's in his mouth. He's got both hands on the keyboard. He's looking at it. I, I don't know. Give Number eight, up. Partagas Maduro was my favorite cigar. I loved him. And they've discontinued him. We can't find him anymore. And then I would say uh, Partagas Red Label Series D. Oh. Cuban. Cuban. Yes. Love him. Series D number four. Love them. I like the fives. The five. I like the fours. The fives. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I've had a. Have I had a five? It's five is not a torpedo, is it? What's the torpedo? That's a number two or something. I like don't that. know. Yeah, I'm not that. I'm not a stogie geek. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very limited in my knowledge. And then one of our uh, sales guys for the whiskey, mm-hmm. his background is cigars, so he's constantly bringing uh, cigars. To, that's Mark. That's Mark. Yeah. Okay. And so Mark is always bringing. Hey, you brought Mark on into your. He's the national sales yes. manager. Yep. Now, Mark has a background in cigar. He came from the cigar. He came from the cigar world, yeah. Now, uh, Will, did you meet Mark when – did Mark work for Outland or did he work for a cigar manufacturer or both? He, wor- he was the general manager for Outland Cigars. Um, so he was really my local tobacconist. Mm, uh, okay. And, and Mark did a great job at, at building that store up. And he, you know, he, he was the one really that, you know, he turned me on to a lot of new product. And he's got a great palate, too. Yeah, he does. Yep. <clears throat> so, no, Mark's your, your national sales manager, and he's bringing you all kinds of cigars now. He, he's brought cigars in that, you know, if I looked at the box or I looked at the label, 
on the shelf, mm-hmm. I would not have given them you a would, second yeah, glance. Yeah. They, they look cheap to me, nondescript. Mm-hmm. They're fantastic. So luckily, I didn't cry too much when the Partagas discontinued the number eights. Because now you have Mark bringing yeah. you all the new... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Did, uh, so I was with Mark, and he got you a box of a cigar called the Larceny. Yeah. Did you smoke that? I did. They're good, aren't they? I was heartbroken. <laughs> I, w- I thought they were okay. They were marginal. They were marginal? Really? Yeah. Wow. They didn't knock my socks off. Now, did you try both? The Larceny is the one where uh, it's Sean Williams blended and one Ortega. and Eddie Ortega blended the other one. So there's two yep. different cigars in that yes. in, the, in the box. And I've smoked them both. They were good. <clears throat> They weren't a smoke it down to the nub cigar for me. Mm-hmm. They were okay, but they started going bitter in my for my palate about halfway. And uh, Mark got us a box of B ones. Oh, B, that's from Burners Cigar. That's their house cigar. They're it, they're the shop that I went up to uh, Golden Valley with. Right. It's so yep. it's B one. I think you. I think they were from when you guys came to camp. So yep, I just yep. got back there in the humidor. I pulled one out and smoked it. Loved it. Loved everything about it. I thought they were great. The, uh, the guy who owns the shop, Burner Cigars, it's a shop in Huntersville, Paul. Mm-hmm. He, he blended that cigar um, at Rocky Patel. He oh, actually okay. went, and, and it was kind of a blend he was tinkering with, and, and a lot of people liked it, and he asked, hey, can I make it for the shop? So he's got it in the shop. They're great. They're fantastic. It's a fantastic cigar. I, I agree. So, Will, what do you – I think you probably know more about what, what Mark was doing down in Miami – with the Defiant Whiskey blended cigars. Am I allowed to talk about that? Are we allowed to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we just did. <laughs> What's going to happen if we do? Are they, is the door going to get kicked in? <laughs> I, love um, I, I could talk. I could talk about it. Because um, I turned that, like, that location device on my iPhone, I turned that off the other yeah. day. <laughs> okay. okay. So... <laughs> We'll, we'll talk uh, non-descript, non-descript about it. How's if it's off limits, I'm sorry I let the cat out of the bag. No, no, I was more worried if it's off limits to you. I, I don't know. Um, I have a tough what, time keeping a secret. Okay, <laughs> so, so what, I, what I'll say is, um, you know, Mark, Mark has been, and Tim, you can confirm this, Mark has obviously been you know, part of the cigar business, and he's doing a lot of whiskey events, and I know he's been teaming up with a lot of manufacturers. And everyone knowing Mark's background, everyone uh, loving the whiskey, came to uh, Mark and said, hey, when are you guys going to have a... Uh, was that him texting you? I say, don't know. Yeah. Was that My him phone's texting blowing Mark up right to now. say shut up? Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe half wheel. I, I think there's an icon with the, you know, the shush. Kind the skull of, and crossbones <laughs> yes. on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it may be half wheel calling. It's an emoticon saying, you know, <laughs> yeah. shush. So Mark got asked a lot about um, about doing this. So Mark's got a lot of relationships in the business. And uh, when Mark went to IPCPR, he was uh, with uh, Cigar and Spirits magazine. And um, so he was there, and he had a conversation with a very prominent family in the cigar business, uh, the Casadas. Um, so I think everyone knows the Casadas right now. And he gave um, the folks at Casada some of the whiskey, and he said, hey, Come back and see if you can blend a cigar to go with this whiskey. So they have come back with three samples. Right now they're just called A, B, and C. I know nothing about the blend. I don't think Mark knows much about the blend either. And um, right now they're in the stage where Mark has given them to people he trusts to smoke and us. <laughs> uh, <to kind laughs> I, I like how you said that, Will. <laughs> and, and, and us. And, he gives uh, it to his most trusted cigar smoking advisors. And, and us. And us. <laughs> and, us. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a process that's going to happen right now where one of those is going to be uh, selected. And then I guess there's a final decision as far as all the I's dotted and T's crossed about um, having a defiant whiskey cigar. And I, I've smoked uh, all three. You have. Me too. I have. I will reserve my. I've sent my feedback to, to Mark. I think Will and I are, are mildly in agreement about yeah. what which one is is better. Can I tell you where I got to smoke mine? Yes, it was great. You were telling me before the show. We're out on a deep sea diving expedition just recently off the coast of New England. We were about 175 miles out of Boston, and we we're diving on an old wreck and uh, pretty deep deep job, 270 feet, and. Uh, we had some bad weather, so we were just steaming weather patterns to try to not get, you know, 
beat up in the rough mm-hmm. seas. Mm-hmm. So slowed the boat down, threw some lines out, went fishing, and uh, drank a little Defiant whiskey and smoked one of the first cigars. And I was, I was blown away. I thought it was fantastic. I thought they were really good. They they were really they were really good. Um, they were all very different, is what I'll, yes. what I'll tell folks. And I think Paul and I were, like I said, pretty close on on which one it was. But I think in general, none of the cigars came back as as bad. And again, the, the Casadas, you know, folks who know listen to the show, they are just one of the iconic factories out of the Dominican Republic. Forty years in business, Manuel Casada is a Hall of Famer. Um, they're going to do the right thing. Mark's got a real good relationship with them for a long time as well. Yeah, and the, the, I think I felt more strongly about the cigar that I liked the best out of the three yeah. uh, than Will did. Will was kind of torn, I think, between a couple of them a little you bit. Had, you had a definitive I was, answer. I was, I was more definitive with okay. what I liked best. So Yeah, one of them I thought longer term is going to was, – was, one of them I thought might pass the other one longer term was, was really what I came back with. What do you mean? So when a cigar – when you have a cigar – uh, we, and we talk a lot about it in the show. It's like wine. Uh, aging is a, is a variable that comes into it. And aging potential will change a cigar over time. And sometimes as you smoke a cigar, you can get a gut feel that the cigar is going to age a certain way. And one of the samples in particular, I said, it might not have been my favorite now, but I think down the road it will be. Okay. And that was the one Paul liked. Mm. That was one I like. But I, I think it's good now. I think it's only going to yeah. get better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so speaking of cigars and whiskey together, which cigar, other than the one that you know you're working on, yeah. which cigars do you like to pair with Defiant Whiskey? I'm not that knowledgeable. Um, a lot of times, I will if I'm in a crowd of you know cigar connoisseurs, mm-hmm. I'll defer. Yeah. And I'll kind of give a brief description of what I know I like, what I've tried in the past. If I can remember what it was. Mm. And uh, I certainly like to have a new cigar put in my hand and go, wow, that's going back to the humidor. I, I tell you what, we've ha- drank a lot of Defiant Whiskey here in the studio. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it, I, can, I, I haven't really found anything that doesn't pair well with yeah. it. It's very versatile, and that's a good quality to have yep. yeah. in a whiskey, especially, you know, one that you're going to have a cigar with. Um, you're going to have a Defiant Whiskey cigar. Mark's got a history in cigars. You're advertising on a cigar podcast. Like, that's a really good quality to have. And I like. There are some spirits where I'm like, wow, I just can't find a cigar to pair with it. Right. This is the total opposite. Everything that I smoke and uh, drink Defiant Whiskey with, I'm like, it goes together. Some things I think better than others, but they all, I'm like, wow, they, that goes really. It doesn't overpower yep. the cigar, which is really it good. Compliments. It complements pretty much any cigar that I've had with it. I think that's one one really good quality to a single malt as a generality mm-hmm. is barley whiskeys are very complex, but very delicate. And they're not like a punch you in the face overpowering yeah. whiskey. And Defiant, because it's, it's not competing with char, it's not competing with peat. Mm hmm. Defiant's a pretty versatile spirit. It's so it's almost dangerously drinkable. It is. It you, is. You can sit down and as evidenced by some empty bottles we've got laying around. <laughs> we call from the top of the label to the bottom of the label, mm-hmm. no man's land, <laughs> because you can't see how how much you right. drank. You know, you got to kind of right. like look up in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it, when you peek out of the bottom of the label, it's coming around from the dark side of the moon, and you're like, oh boy, this is going to be. Yeah, we just dangerous. put a bottle away again. Yeah. And we're in Rhode Island. We get it, it when you get below the label. That's like what we call belly buster territory. Like you've drank so much that you got to go get the Rhode Island um, drunken food, which is called. Yeah, you, belly and you busters. guys don't have Waffle House. Uh, no Waffle House in Rhode Island. We have hot wieners. Call them belly busters. I won't hold yeah. that against you. I won't judge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta go to, we got to take Paul to the Waffle House at, like, midnight. Waffle House down. is great. I've been to Waffle House in North Carolina. Have you really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. I love Waffle House. Um, so, <coughs> well, did you have more questions for Tim? So, so, Tim, we've talked about the Defiant Whiskey. Have you thought maybe down the road, are you looking at any, like, second, second releases, a second whiskey or something like that? So, our two, the two master distillers that we have that have taken over from me are just great guys. They live it, eat it, breathe it, sleep whiskey. They have just yesterday, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> bottled the first, I think it was 22 cases of 100% rye. Wow. 
It is knock your socks off good. It's the it's all the best attributes of standard barley defiant, but with that peppery rye, and it is it's remarkable. So for right now, we've got our hands completely full, just making enough defiant. And if we add something immediately, it'll be the rye. And I think we're going to probably, in the, in the not too far distant future, release a cask strength defiant. So let me back up, Tim. This is a great opportunity for me to ask questions uh, and get some, some good in-depth knowledge. Yeah. So you described the process for making the defiant whiskey, and it's barley-based. So what's the, what differs when you make a rye? It's a choice of grain. So instead of loading bags of, of whole kernel barley into mm-hmm. the mill in the morning, you load rye in instead. Mm-hmm. A big difference between barley and rye is barley has a husk on it, right, on, uh, for a skin. Mm-hmm. Rye has a skin that's more like, you know the thin skin on a peanut? Yeah. So rye is more like that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of distilleries will grind the grain into a, a much finer flour and they'll just heat it, cook it, mm-hmm. cool it, and then put it in their mash tuns and pitch yeast on it. That kind of pisses the yeast off. And they'll produce alcohol, but they produce off compounds as well. Mm-hmm. So we lauder like a beer brewer would, mm-hmm. which means in the morning we go in, we fire up the mill, we crack, we crack the barley, we add it to the hot water, and then before we drain that tank down, we lauder it. So we separate the grain solids, the grain husks, from the liquid, the wash. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that gets qualified into our fermenters is the liquid wash, the clear liquid wash. you strain it or filter it, essentially. Yes. Yeah, okay. And that creates... And you filter it for the barley and the rye? You can do it with rye, but mm-hmm. it's a very difficult process. So with, with barley, a big part of the filter media when you lauder is the husk. Mm-hmm. Where with rye, not having that husk, mm-hmm. we've had... Thousand gallon batches of rye mash turn into just glue. Oh, I mean, you can barely pump the stuff. It's an mm-hmm. absolute mess. So after after about a year and a half of messing with the recipe, we found a method for laudering rye mm-hmm. and doing a laudered rye mash and a laudered rye ferment mm-hmm. to where you get the best of the rye without those pissed off yeast. Mm-hmm. And it's a pretty unique process. Interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Wow. It, now, flavor characteristics, how would you describe the difference between a regular whiskey and a rye whiskey? Boy, you know, I, uh, I like making whiskey, believe it or not. I, you know, I own the company. It's, it's been a passion of my life. I don't consider myself a really hoity-toity uh, taster when it comes to descriptions of yeah, hand the rub, nose saddle, the, leather, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and like mahogany. And I hear you. We're the same way with cigars, too, though. We're not, you know, and we talk about some of those more descriptive terms, but for the most part, you know, we've got a very straight to the punch uh, rating system for our cigars. So, yeah. So you go in for breakfast in the morning. Saturday morning, you wake up, you have your second cup of coffee, you go to the local breakfast joint. Mm-hmm. You got wheat toast and you got rye toast. Mm hmm. Rye with a you know a slab of butter on it—that's a bread unlike any other. Rye yeah. toast to me is just it's got fantastic. some bold, yeah, bold flavors. Great. Is how I yeah. describe rye. The whiskey and the bread, right? Yes. You're just very bold flavors. That's right. Yeah. It's so signature. What what the difference between a single malt, a barley whiskey, and a rye whiskey? Rye has such a, a unique signature. It's such a peppery, mm-hmm. full-bodied whiskey. Mm-hmm. But it, if if done right, it still has all the delicate notes and, and has all that buttery, oily smoothness to it. Mm-hmm. Ryes are just... Corn whiskeys, to me... They, corn whiskeys don't agree with my palate. I mm-hmm. appreciate corn whiskeys, but they're a little too bold, and I think they take too much of their palate from, from the oak. Mm-hmm. Whereas with a good rye, it shines through to the end. You can taste the grain. You can almost close your eyes and see you know, the rye in the field before it's been cut. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a pretty special whiskey. And the American palate as a whole right now, is really shifting back to rye whiskeys. And ryes were hugely popular, you know, at the turn of the century. People yeah. loved rye whiskeys, and they're starting to love them again. It's interesting. You know, we're talking about the different choices in cigars and the different cigars we like to smoke. Um, it seems to me that in the past five years, there's been this just surge of different whiskeys, scotch, yeah. rye, bourbon. I mean, it's just been an explosion. Yep. Um, so what, what do you think contributes to that? And then what do you do and continue to do to stand apart from the rest? Well, I don't know necessarily what the big uh, 
resurrection of whiskey as a whole has been. And there's still a lot of people, there's so much awareness that is yet to be brought back to the market. So, you know, there's a lot of people that will say, you know, they like, they're not a big fan of whiskey, but they like bourbon. Mm. And you're going, but bourbon is a whiskey. whiskey. Bourbon is a whiskey. So I think there's a big awareness. It's, I think it's simply something that people hadn't realized existed. They'd mm-hmm. heard about it. Their grandfather drank it. Their father drank it. They'd walk past the labels. They'd walk past the aisles. They had a friend that got too drunk on it in college. They, mm-hmm. they kind of turned their back on it. And now they're kind of rediscovering whiskey for the first time. And, you know, whiskey is considered the most complex adult beverage there is as far as being able to dig through it with your palate, mm-hmm. even more so than red wine. So I think people are really embracing that, and they're moving away from, you know, the cocktails, the flavored vodkas, mm-hmm. and they're discovering whiskey again, and that's a that's a really great thing. Well, and whiskey cocktails are on they're on fire. They're on fire. I think people, I don't know if people got tired of vodka cocktails. I know when I look at a cocktail menu wherever we go, because I like to drink cocktails, I'm like vodka, you know, Bacardi rum or whatever you know and i skip past those and i'm like tell me what cocktails you have with bourbon or whiskey in them and those are the ones i i gravitate to in in sample right um and i think more and more uh establishments are having a lot more of these whiskey uh and bourbon cocktails i agree which i think is great i really like the in terms of a i think a vodka cocktail they all kind of they taste like whatever you're mixing it with that's right to be to be quite honest the legal definition of vodka if you go to the government website ttb website and read it is it it can have no predominant signature flavor or taste Mm -hmm. of the base ingredient it was distilled from right so it's just raw alcohol Mm -hmm. Uh, the only thing you can really do with the vodka is is try to make it smooth and not have a burn to it yeah but you if you're sipping, sitting down with a vodka on the rocks, are you drinking it to enjoy it or are you drinking for effect? Right, right. And I think with whiskey, you're drinking to enjoy it. Yes. You're drinking to get to the flavors. It. It's all about the flavors for me. Yeah. You know? With a good, a good sip of whiskey, you get it in your palate. You roll it around. You get that, you get that aroma up behind your eyeballs like you do with a good cigar. You get mm-hmm. it in your head, you mm-hmm. know? And uh, that's not, I don't think that's the case for vodka. Right. And I get a lot of those from with cocktails as well. And we've mixed some cocktails with the Defiant whiskey. Yeah. And it, it, it's great to see how it works in a cocktail and experiment with it. Exactly. Um, the nice part of experimenting is you can get really drunk, too. You can. <laughs> and then you can <laughs> forget happens. how much you liked it. Yes. you got to try it all over again the exactly. next day. <laughs> um, but we made some earlier. Um, it's one of our variations on the Defiant uh, lemonade. We just mix it with lemonade. Yeah, like a two to a two to one ratio or whatever. Um, we you know, experiment with the ratio. Yep, it's great summer drink because you can still. I mean, yeah, there's lemonade in it, so you get a lot of the lemonade flavor, but you get some of the you can taste some of the whiskey in the background, um, which brings a nice flavor component, mm-hmm. uh, and it makes it for a nice nice summer drink as well. Uh, it works great. We've tried it in an old fashioned. Yep, actually works great in an old. And an old fashioned is it's a cocktail, but it's not like a vodka mixed cocktail, mm-hmm. right? It's the only. It's just whiskey and fruit and bitters. So it works really well in an old fashioned too. Black tea, like a, a good Earl Grey. Mm-hmm. Shot of Defiant, mm-hmm. little honey. Oh, Unbelievable. Nice. So like an after dinner. Is it like an after dinner kind just of cocktail? just kind of a little hot toddy? Yeah, a good spiced rum cider mm-hmm. with Defiant. Knock your socks off, good. Nice. One of our guys, one of our distillers' favorite wintertime drink is just a good hot chocolate mm-hmm. with the fine in it. Mm. Crazy good. It's great that you can drink it neat on the rocks or in a cocktail. Neat it's is very, my favorite. Yeah, it's, it's very versatile. And it, yeah. That's a component that I look for in cigars, too. You know, can I smoke that cigar at different points in the day with different beverages, with different meals, before a meal, after a meal kind of thing. The versatility of a cigar is important. Same thing, <laughs> excuse me, with whiskey. It has to be versatile, mm-hmm. right? And versatility is what draws you to buy a case or buy a box or that's keep right. some in stock. And I think that's a or really important. Or go and tell your friends about it because you're excited about this thing yeah. you've just found. And that's the component that I see in, in the finance. It's a lot of versatility as well as all the other wonderful flavors and things that it brings. So Agreed. Cool. <clears throat> Will, more questions for Tim? Yeah, Tim, actually... Um about a month and a half ago, I think it was, well, back in August, you guys had some pretty good uh, press on the John Stewart show. Unbelievable. Why don't you talk about that? I don't even know what to talk about. We don't know how it happened. 
We walked into the distillery on a Friday morning, the day, the morning after the last episode for the John Stewart Daily Show. It was his last last episode of the Daily Show, or his appearance on it. Like, did it continue the Daily Show, or is that it for the Daily Show? I wasn't sure which one it was. Can you speak to that, Will? Um, don't know. I think it's the end of the Daily Show. I okay. thought it was. Yeah, that's it's that's finished. It. It's done. Yeah. And the replacement is going to be the Stephen Colbert show. No, oh, probably that probably. would be a logical replacement. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Oh, he's Thanks. Letterman's replacement. Uh, in any case, the last Daily Show. <laughs> Walked in in the morning, and I, we started getting lit up on Facebook and, yeah. and and Twitter, and and somebody said we saw you know congratulations, we saw your bottle. How'd you do that? And I thought, I don't know. We sat down over coffee, pulled it up in the office, started watching, and sure enough, like 15 minutes and 20 sec- 28 seconds in, there's, uh, you know, Mika from, I, I think it's... Yeah, who was the, the, the lady? What was her? Uh, Mika Brzezinski yes. from uh, Morning Joe. Morning Joe. MSNG. From Morning Joe. Yep. So she's taking a big old pull off Defiant, you know, wipes her chin off and then says, see you later, pipsqueak, to uh, John Stewart, and we're sitting there yeah. going... How did that happen? I think people like our whiskey. You have to put a placement in there no. like that without, yeah. Yeah, so right. You had, no, you had no idea that she was a fan of the whiskey. We had no idea. No clue. And then there was a few people that I thought that are, you know, in the business in New York that like the whiskey that I thought maybe they kind of slid it in. And I emailed them and was like, hey, thanks. Great work. And they're like, we saw it too. That wasn't us. So was it her? I don't know. I have no You'll idea. Never, mm. I'd like to find out. That's I'll give awesome. a free tour and a bottle of whiskey reward to anybody that can <laughs> tell me where that came from. <laughs> if we could get her smoking a cigar, Paul. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I could see her smoking a cigar. In a Stoke it. Geek Smoke Naked t-shirt. We'll send her a free Stoke Naked t-shirt. That's it. There you go. <clears throat> That's really cool. Yeah. We got a lot, of, a lot of really exciting stuff coming up. Fourth quarter, 15, with marketing and whatnot for the brand. It's nice. It's really... Uh, it's hard to figure out what is the right marketing, and, and you know our number one thing is to stay organic. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I say organic, I'm not talking ingredient based. I'm talking about or, or authentic, organic, organic growth, not one that you're paying for. That's right. Kind of thing. You know, I I totally hear that. And we've got a lot of great venues that have just been serendipitously falling in our laps at the right time. That's great. I wanted to uh, ask you another kind of technical question about whiskey. You said sure. cask strength. Yeah. So what is cask strength? So traditional cask strength for a scotch is right at about 125 proof. Mm-hmm. And there's people that age stronger than that. There's people that age uh, at a lesser proof than that. So is it just you're distilling it with a higher alcohol content? No. So what, when we run off the still, we actually come off at, at higher than 125 so we'll cut it, we'll homogenize it, we'll proof it, we'll mm-hmm, check it, mm-hmm. and then we have a software program that we'll run it through at the distillery on a scale, mm-hmm. and then it'll, we'll add groundwater untouched out of the ground and bring it down to cast strength, mm-hmm. and we'll proof it again oh, and make I sure see. we're there. <clears throat> so with this, you bring it down lower, alcohol content. After aging. After aging, okay. And then we'll, we'll proof it down again to yep. bottling strength. Okay. So cast strength is kind of the sweet spot to where... The solvent nature of the whiskey in uh, relationship to the oak, you get the components, you get the compounds, you get the tannins, you get the sugars out of the oak, you extract Mm -hmm. them without starting to get a lot of the bitters or things. So if you were to age stronger, you can start getting things out of the oak that you don't necessarily want. Mm -hmm. And if you age at a lesser proof, you got more water, you can start to oxidize more of the oak. So it's kind of, for us, 125 is, is... the number that we age at, and it works great. Mm-hmm. And you, you'll lose a little bit of proof depending on the season. Sometimes you can evaporate some of the water out, and mm-hmm. your proof will go up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Sometimes during the season, you, your proof will go down a little bit. But we're thinking about doing uh, cast strength and potentially an unfiltered cast strength. Mm-hmm. Oh, so the unfiltered refers to the mash ton. Unfiltered would refer to the fact that when it comes off oak, that we don't even polish it, we don't filter it. Mm-hmm. It's going to have oak you know, silt in the bottles. Mm -hmm. And we do minimum filtering as it is. Mm -hmm. So when our whiskey comes off oak, sometimes, you know, people will find a little bit of settling in the bottom of the bottle. It's 100% natural. There's nothing wrong with the whiskey. It's because we're not going through a whole bunch of processes to strip out stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, 
It's, and that doesn't mean it ages in the bottle either. No, no, no. It's done right. once it comes off. Because once it hits the glass, that's it. It's done. It's done. It's aging. done. Yep. That's right. That's right. That's cool. Yep. So, Tim, are you ready to play five questions with Stoey Geeks? Did Mark prepare you as for this? As long as this isn't like truth or dare or anything. <laughs> it's just five random silly questions. Okay. Okay. Three words to describe yourself. Ooh. Five? Three words? Three words to describe yourself. Uh, boy, that's a toughie. Um, passionate? Uh, lunatic? And dreamer, I would say. A passionate, lunatic dreamer. Excellent. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A bench vice. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Defiant. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I've never even heard of Ask Grabby Grabby. It's popular in Europe. It's, oh, boy. I'm going to pass on that one. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's like a multiple choice, first or second. I'll go first. <laughs> okay. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Two celebrities. Does that's, it have to be the actual one. actor or a role they played? It doesn't matter. You have complete creative freedom, alive or dead. Han Solo and Princess Leia. There you go. I love. You See, go. Star Wars fan. With this one person in studio, who will remain nameless, Chris, that has not watched Star Wars. Who? <laughs> Chris. <laughs> and we give him crap for that all the That's time. That's punishable by Rhode Island law. I think it? so. It wasn't Will, alive Will, when it came out. It wasn't alive when he came Will, out. Now, Will, you've seen Star Wars, right? I have seen Star Wars. There you I, go. I, I used to have a Han Solo figure, and I used to freeze him when I was a kid. In the fr- in the freezer? <laughs> in the freezer, yeah. I had the action figures, and I used to take them, and I'd freeze them in a, like a margarine. Container. That's fantastic. You, ever- you know, there's Han Solo ice cube trays. <laughs> yes. I just found that out yesterday. Have you seen the door? No. It's like a thing you can stick on your door, and it looks like Han Solo frozen in the carbonite. I thought that was pretty cool. That's fantastic. Alrighty. Well, Tim, thank you very much for appearing on the Stoey Geek Show. It's wonderful having you here live in studio. Um, and we, we thank you for sponsoring us and uh, sending us whiskey. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for the cigar. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Cheers, we'll take well. a short break. Come back and talk about our debonair ideal segment for this evening. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 